The following podcast is scheduled for one fall. Welcome to Deedas and Dragons. I thought this was going to be hard. <laughs> Welcome to Deedas and Dragons. Who wants some of the Ripper? Fair state champs, baby. Woo! Smile, man. Who just quickly cast the people? I'm a man of the people. Shattered world. Ripper, no! Ripper, and welcome to another episode of the DeejCast, the supplemental podcast for our YouTube show, Deejas and Dragons. I'm your host, Nate Lindbergh, and you can find me on Twitter at Nate Lindbergh, and you follow our brand on Facebook, Twitter, and most importantly, YouTube at Deej Time. Now, do you want to be a part of this show? Hey, you can be. Please join us. Email us at DeejTime at gmail.com or leave us a message for us at DeejTime voicemail at 617-506-9686 and we'll answer your questions, read your comments right here next week. Now, right now on our YouTube show, we're in the midst of playing the Worldwide Wrestling RPG. Today's topic, we're going to be talking about mental health and pro wrestling. And you know what? We'll get into all of that in just a minute. But before we do, let's, uh, let's say hello to a couple familiar faces. And a couple new ones. Now, they say if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. Well, our veteran RPG gamer and permanent member of our player panel wasn't trying to teach me how to play dodgeball. He just found a wrench and threw it at me. Okay, none of that really happened, but it's certainly something I could see him doing. Let's say hey to Tony Shamuxis. Yeah, that checks out. I would would probably, I mean, maybe not to hurt severely, (laughs) but... I mean, if the opportunity were to arise, I would definitely weigh my options on both sides of the table. I kind of figured. But, you know, hey, with you, I expect nothing less. Love you, buddy. <laughs> Love you, too. And keeping on the theme of Ben Stiller flicks, when our resident game master and therapy expert approached me to start a YouTube channel to highlight tabletop RPG games and their therapeutic benefits, he said to me, you know what, let's call it the Conrad Audette YouTube channel for people who can RPG good and want to therapy good, too. And I said, Conrad, I love the idea, but I think we need a new name. Please welcome Conrad Audette. What is this? A a show for ants? Uh, it might be. It might be a show for ants or or something like that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Absolutely don't know. right. I got nothing. I got nothing. Files are in the computer. Uh, I think I could segue better than that, but no, nope, not me, not me. Now, as I said a little bit ago on Deeds and Dragons, we've been playing the Worldwide Wrestling RPG, and as some of you guys might know, I'm a pretty big wrestling nerd. Uh, now, when I'm not deejing it up, I'm, uh, I'm uh, actually the author of a weekly column on PWTorch.com where I rate each segment of WWE's Wednesday night show, NXT, either a, a hit or a miss and give it my analysis as to why. Uh, I'm also the co-host of PW Torch's Thursday daily cast, PWT Talks NXT, where we give our breakdown and analysis of this week's NXT episode. Now, we, our, no, I, I'm not talking about Conrad and Tony, uh, Let's give a warm welcome to my favorite co-host on PWT Talks NXT, Shut Up Kelly, a frequent co-host on the Wade Keller Pro Wrestling Podcast and post shows where he provides his wrestling analysis, Mr. Tom Stout. Thank you. And now I hope Kelly listens to this. Yes, I am uh, (laughs) at Tom Stout on Twitter, T-O-M-S-T-O-U-P. And if I am a Ben Stiller movie, since Zoolander is already taken, I'll go with uh, the Meyerowitz stories. Ooh. There we go. Uh, it's actually one I, I don't know if I've seen, but with but you've you've watched a bunch of movies I've never seen. The the awkward silence after I read the title was appropriate. <laughs> what what is that even about? I don't even. Uh, it's a nice ensemble film about a family uh, gathering around their ailing patriarch, played by uh, Dustin Hoffman. Oh, that's a right. that's an overly simplistic synopsis, but I'll I'll uh, refrain from going too much deeper. <laughs> I'm, I, and in my head canon, that is now part of the Fokker, Meet the Fokker franchise. That uh, checks out. <laughs> uh, all right. Also joining us tonight is a guest that I'm personally very excited to have on the show with us tonight because, you know, heck, I've actually never been able to do a podcast with him before. Now, he's the author of the weekly Alt Perspective Raw Report on PWTorch.com. He's the host of one of PW Torch's VIP podcasts, On the Canvas, where he takes a look at the artistry of pro wrestling. And he's also another frequent flyer on the Wade Keller Pro Wrestling Podcast and post shows. He's PWTorch.com analyst, Zach Haydorn. Hey, guys. How's it going? Great. Thrilled to be here. And I don't, gosh, I'm so, so behind on my movies. I don't even know that I could quote a Ben Stiller movie that, that you guys aren't already haven't quoted. I'm, I'm, I'm behind the curve on that, but I'm happy to be here with y'all. 
That's all right. That's all right. We're happy to have you. We're happy to have you. Has anybody ever seen the movie Heavyweights? I was wondering if we were going to get a Heavyweights reference. I was thinking of making one myself. And, and we're not here to talk about this, but whatever. Tom, I know I told you about this a while ago. A little while ago, I, uh, I went to go see Brad Sherwood and Colin Mockery of Whose Line Is It Anyway? And I got to actually get up on stage and, and do a little, Im- little bit of improv with them just because I raised my hand. And they had me say a line. And my line was, never put Twinkies on your pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. <laughs> so now... We're not here to talk about Twinkies Pizza, whose line is it anyway, or, or Colin Mockery. Um, we're here to talk about pro wrestling and uh, mental health here. So I think I might be taking a little bit of a gamble with this topic. I think this is either going to spark, spark some great conversation, or it's going to be a question that we answer in three minutes and leave, it's going to leave us a lot of time to fill. But uh, <laughs> after, we, uh, after we started diving into therapy and RPG gaming, um, I started noticing some similarities between escapism in gaming uh, described to me not just by Conrad and Tony uh, by their own an- anecdotal experiences, uh, but by nearly everyone that we've talked to thus far right here on the DeejCast. Uh, every developer that we've spoken with um, have all personally found that RPGs help them in some various way, uh, whether it was playing a game or, or developing them. Um, now, RPG gaming, uh, believe it or not, uh, was never really a passion of mine. Uh, and to some extent, it's, it's still not. It's a uh, I definitely appreciate it. I believe in what we do and I enjoy playing RPGs, but wrestling was really what I latched onto as my escape. Um, and to, some, and to a lot of extent, uh, to this day, it is really my escape. Um, now, I've got my own thoughts as to why that, you know, I, I believe I latched onto it and why a lot of wrestling fans become just so ardent fans and, and, and so um, they just, they love the business so much. Uh, but first, I kind of want to hear from, from everybody else and uh, kind of see where, where everybody else stands on it. And I want to see if it kind of comes in line with my own views before I, before I start talking about it. Uh, we, we've actually got a great mix of wrestling fandom here today on the show. Uh, Conrad and Tony, they've been you know, casual fans of wrestling for years. Uh, you know, they've gone with me to bingo halls to see local wrestling. Uh, they've come to me with, with, uh, to local, or sorry, they've come to me to Boston to go see like Raw, SmackDown. Um, they actually came with me to go see Raw and it turned out to be the lowest, Raw, uh, lowest rated Raw ever. I found out from Wade oh, man. today. Um, that was terrible. I'm it was sorry. real good. Yeah, I'm, I, it opened up with this giant brawl between Lashley and Roman Reigns, and and the whole locker room spilled out, and and I don't remember the whole thing, but it was like it was just really terrible. It was bad. Um, I'm sorry I dragged you guys to that, but you know, <laughs> some friend you are, right? Honestly. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, so like I said, you know, they, um, you know, they so they they're. They're familiar with wrestling. They've, they've been fans, casual fans over the years. Uh, and then obviously we have uh, you know, the three of us, Zach, Tom, and I. Um, we're obviously pretty diehard wrestling fans. So I think this will uh, this, sh- this should be a cool conversation. We're going to start first with, with Tony. Tony, if you, had yes. to muster, if you had to muster a guess, what do you think it is about wrestling that hooks people in the way that it does? Um, well, what hooks me personally into wrestling, honestly, is, is really the showmanship of everything, um, because everything's all scripted. The, uh, all the wrestlers and all the athletes have to know how to, how to do everything in a way that looks cool, um, for A, the camera, B, the crowd, um, and C, not hurt each other while doing it, um, and and some of these moves these guys pull uh, these guys and and the men and women pull off are fantastic and so bombastic and amazing um like some of my favorite wrestling sh- uh, you know matches that i've that you know Nate has shown my my old roommate ben who's who's in the uh, the game with us uh the, the 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 wrestling game with us uh the uh, like all all the people who do like all the acrobatics and the flipping off the top ropes. Um, like most of the luchador underground stuff that I've seen is just fantastic and so much fun to watch. Ben showed you Lucha underground. Yeah. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't realize you watched it. All right, cool. A little bit. Yeah. No, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. I, I, but, uh, but yeah, I just, really just the, 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 the fantastic display of it all is, is what really draws me in as, as at least as a casual fan. Sure, sure, and uh, and and 
kind of sticking on the casual fan, Conrad, I kind of same question. Um, you know, what is it that, that, you know, either you think draws the average person in or the, you know, the average wrestling fan or even yourself, uh, you know, into, uh, into the business. So for, for the record, I, at, <laughs> I have included some cool wrestling stuff, I think into big moments in my own personal life, which are, like, yes, you have super cheesy. I mean, so my engagement photos, my my wife and I think that like the traditional like over the top romance that literally everybody does is just so boring. And we did like an array of of pictures that just were more us. And one of them is both of us uh, dropping good old DX uh, to the camera. Uh, and the photographer actually. There we um, go. I'm actually yeah, showing it, it to the guys as we speak. Wow. Um, yep. So that's uh, one of my engagement photos. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's really when I was most into wrestling was at that, that point in time. Um, like the, the rocks had a pretty like big influence on me. On, and, but at the time, I mean, you know, I, I love Stone Cold like everybody else. I loved Kane. Kane was like one who like really spoke to me personally. Me too. Um, Cause like, so we were 10, um, what I remember like, and so I was five, seven and like one forty five uh, when we were 10 and everybody else was a lot smaller than me. <laughs> so yep. I like kind of felt like I was like Kane, like of the group when we did our backyard wrestling. Um, and so yeah. that's kind of <laughs> like did. where I felt that connection. And like, I like tried to choke slam other people, but then I also didn't want to hurt them. So then it like looked like it looked real bad. Uh, Cause we recorded obviously, you know, like my gentle choke slams of other 10 year olds. Um, would not have done Kane proud. But my ability to get up after literally every move that's done to me within a second uh, would have done Kane proud. But that was true of straight up everybody else as well. As a group of 10-year-olds, nobody wanted to stay down after any moves whatsoever. Nobody um, wanted to be the jobber. So the other, uh, the other moment was actually at my wedding I was so when proud. I was so they proud. They introduce uh, so like at like the after party when they introduce you know the the wedding party first. Uh, we had uh, this just like dance song um, by uh, Pentatonix, um, and then for uh, my wife and I, it was John Cena's theme, and so like nobody expected it. Nobody expected it. Um, every you could see, like, in the record, like, everybody's like, what's happening? <laughs> and, like, looking. And we're just doing the wave, like, can't see me. <laughs> like, we're coming out. And it was just, like, you know, the, the reactions were all jovial, certainly. It was mixed just, like, it was either confused laughing uh, or pumped up laughing. Um, but one way or the other, you know, so those were two, like, pretty significant uh you know parts parts that are will always be recorded uh for us <laughs> that is true so what i really think get, gets people so into wrestling is uh i'm going to go into my favorite psychologist who isn't actually a kind of behavioral uh but is actually a psychoanalyst which i know in like the clinical world that's like no 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 uh, that's like Freud was like the, the original like psychoanalyst, but uh, C.G. Jung. And he actually traveled around the world collecting folklore. And he examined it with every different uh, country he went to. And he found that there were all of these same themes with the stories that were told. And there were these archetypes. And that's where he comes up with his whole archetypal structure. Um, that there are like the heroes in every culture that, you know, um, if you look at like Hercules in like, or Heracles in Greece, Hercules in Rome, uh, or over in uh, Japan, like Susano, um, 
uh, you look back at like Mesopotamia, like Gilgamesh, like they all fill these very similar roles of being like heroes. And I think that these, this way like stories are told and the characters that are presented, it has that like heroic feel. And at least that's kind of like why, definitely why I was so into wrestling then was, you know, I, I looked at all of the characters with these different lenses. And at the time I wasn't like, oh, he's fulfilling the villain archetype. But, you know, I looked at them as like heroic and having like more human than human uh, attributes with their, you know, their muscles and their moves. And, and when like the moves happen, it's like, you know, oh, that, that person is not getting back up from anything, but then they do. Uh, and it's like, it's like this like clash of demigods. Um, and so, uh, I, why I've kind of like stayed lashed onto it is, is like that type of stuff, you know, it's, it's the, the closer to like the true, like feats of like heroic or the feats of like superb strength or what Tony was saying about like this, the crazy flight. Uh, that like the athletes take um, and then you know visually we see it's like oh that again it's like that's like getting hit by a car like the way that just went down but you know then it's like oh they fight through it in this you know yeah. this powerful fashion um, the, the variety of the roster and like what they can do in their personalities like I feel like everybody can relate to somebody in some way and while certainly lots of people rally around like certain people who like become champions or the heel becomes a champion and everybody rallies again you know around whoever is fighting them um these they just mirror our own storytelling since the beginning you know like gilgamesh is the first you know thing we have recorded and it's you know this story of the hero king and like I look at the rock the same way that I like read Gilgamesh. The Scorpion um, King. <laughs> the Scor- I do not <laughs> look at the Scorpion King <laughs> the same way. I see the rock as a wrestler as having like more powers as <laughs> than the Scorpion King. No, I would agree uh, with that. You know, the people's eyebrow can you know stun somebody into submission while the scorpion is oh like catching the arrow or whatever. Um but any, anyway, you know, that's, I digress. <laughs> um, so, you know, and I really like, you know, the, the silly theatrics. Um, the, I, I know it's like a video that's gone around and I, I always forget the federation that puts it on, but where the guy wears the like snake mask Shikara. and Shikara and, he starts like waving his hands and hypnotizing them and okay. everybody just starts breaking out into this dance. And then this random guy who like is massive, he just starts like taking off his clothes and he just like starts dancing along the ringside. And I'm like, man, like this, this is such a great gimmick. <laughs> I was just so into it. And it, it <laughs> I know that like you guys, who, uh, may not see that in the same light I, I see it but but as a casual fan i thought i was just friggin' great uh and i wanted <laughs> to see more of that so now going from the the casual side of things um let's go over to the more ardent fans the 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 pro wrestling analysts if you will here um so let's first go over to uh mr zach haydorn now zach um Zach, like I said earlier, he has a podcast uh, where he he looks at the artistry of pro wrestling. Um, and, and Zach, if you want to, feel, please feel free to uh, you know talk about that and, and anything else that you do. Uh, but I thought Zach would have a really good take on uh, this topic in particular, just because of the nature and the theme of his podcast. And I uh, you know, I wanted to wanted to see if you'd be uh, be willing to come on. Very glad that you're here and uh, give us your take um, you know on this topic. Yeah, no, and I uh, appreciate th- th- you having me. I mean, it's 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 really cool to get all these different perspectives. And I think <clears throat> for me, it, it really is rooted in kind of the 
kind of what I kind of deem like the, the art of wrestling. And I think it, it, it's that, that element and that idea is, is very much for me is, is rooted in and, the, and it kind of laid on the foundation of how the crowd interacts and influences what's going on in the ring. And I think that from when you're a, if even if you're a casual fan or, I mean, it's why wrestling can appeal to, you know, a five-year-old kid and, you know, a 35-year-old man like me. Cause it, cause regardless of what it is, you know, you have a vesting interest in the, the product and the art that you're watching based on, on how you're, on how you're reacting back to it. So it's like when you're first starting out and you're a, 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 a young fan and, and you see John Cena, it's like, okay, man, I'm cheering. I'm all out. I'm on the edge of my seat. I got the shirt. I got the toys. Like I'm, you know, you're looking at that's, that's your reaction. That's your reality. You're reacting to that. And now being a little bit of a, of a, of an older fan who, who is an, an adult, it's like, you can still, you know, judge those reactions and look at those reactions. And I, I get lost in, in that part of it. I love watching a good wrestling match. No doubt about it. I love watching a good promo. No doubt about it. But what I really like most is seeing what is working based on, on what's happening in the ring because that reaction is there. It's like, you look at, we were talking movies for a little bit off the air and, and joking about Ben Stiller movies, but it's like, you think about that. There's no other art form maybe like a live concert, but there's no other art form that's influenced in real time by the subjects that are, that are judging it. And wrestling very, very much is those guys in the ring are, are using that audience to tell a story. They're using that audience to, to, to build drama for their, for their matches. They're using that audience to convey, um, a sense of a sense of good and evil and, and pitting that, you know, up against, up against each other. And the audience is, is is key to that it's why people felt so uncomfortable watching <laughs> watching wrestling without fans because yeah. you don't have that 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 there to to play off of you don't have that real time that real time influence where you can say hey this is working or this isn't um and then uh, on the flip side of that it's it's watching the stars in the ring react to that it's watching stone cold steve austin be able to control and manipulate a crowd of thousands of people to react exactly how he needs them to same thing with 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 a really good heel like i i find good heel work um fascinating because it's like you have to get a whole building of people to engage with you by being this just terrible person and people willingly, willingly do so. It's, it's, I just think it's such a manipulation of psychology, um, and, uh, and sport athleticism all rolled into one, one, one product that, um, you can take a lot of different things out of by just watching the same show. Like all of us could watch, uh, you know, a good, a good wrestling match and we can each probably pull out a totally different thing, um, that, spoke to us um and it's rooted in in that type of reaction and that's that's to me what what kind of keeps it evergreen as as a hobby and as a as an art form that i can watch from from now until whenever with this whole this whole no crowd era that we're currently in right now for for you guys that aren't necessarily wrestling fans obviously with the whole covid pandemic um you, you can't put a whole bunch of wrestling fans in an arena right now, at least responsibly um, or legally in some places, most places. Um, so, you know, it, it was really strange when, um, you know, when, when they first kind of went on the air that very first night, uh, I believe it was a SmackDown because actually Tom, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. Cause you were at NXT, right? Yeah. I was, what? I was at the last WWE event that had fans. That's right. You were. Oh man, that's crazy. Yeah, and um, and that very next that very next SmackDown Friday night um, was the eeriest thing. Uh, they had you know they rather than being in an arena, they were um, you know they they have a performance center down in in uh, Orlando uh, Orlando area, um, and they they converted the performance center into an arena. They put a ring there, they put a stage, and then they there was just all of these empty seats. They put all these empty seats. They didn't have to, they weren't fans there. They didn't, these seats weren't already there, um, but they put all these empty seats around and, and they said it was to, you know, the WWE universe, their fans, WWE universe, they're there in spirit and, and things like that. And to me, it was just so weird and eerie and there was no crowd noise. And 
Um, they've, yep. They're letting they're letting now uh, at least you know WWE. Uh, they have other wrestlers. You know, usually either you know, uh, trainees or, or like really kind of low on the totem pole undercard wrestlers. Um, you're standing around the ring and cheering and things, but it's still not that that roar of you know thousands and thousands and thousands of fans. Um, it's weird. It's really weird, uh, and it's certainly changed the way I know I've watched wrestling. Um, you know, I've talked a lot about it with Tom and and Kelly on PWT Talks NXT, but like it really changed the way I watch wrestling because it's like you didn't have that reaction from the crowd, and you know I'm sitting there going, okay, I know how I like this, and you know especially you know because I, I get kind of that analyst mind, and and you know especially I'm having to go on and uh, and and talk about wrestling uh, you know, on a weekly basis, um, I'm it it really changed the way I'm watching it, and I'm like I'm like okay, I know how I like this. But is this how, is this like the general perception? Does everybody, you know, it, it was really weird to try and, and I, I don't want to say form my own opinions because, you know, like, obviously, I mean, I'm going to do that anyway, but um, kind of then to validate them just with the response of the crowd and, and things like that. Um, so, yeah, very, very strange. But, um, but yeah, I've rambled on long enough. Uh, so let let's go over uh, let's go over to Tom. Tom, uh, you know your your thoughts on on kind of the same thing, and and if you want, even you know um, you know like you said, you were the you were at the last episode of of uh, WWE television that that was you know, televised with the crowd. Even if you want to touch on that and experience there, yeah. Which and that uh, and I, actually, I did have the opportunity to talk about this on Zach's show uh, as as we talked about what WrestleMania might look like without a crowd before WrestleMania took That's place. Right. And yeah. uh, one of the things I said, and this this was only just a few weeks after this had taken place, and uh, I've I've lived with this now for a little while, so the embarrassment isn't really there. But there is a little bit of embarrassment because. At this point that this, I think it, I'd have to look at a calendar. I think it was March 16th or something like that, right in the middle of, middle yeah, of March. That sounds right. Um, yeah, a, a Wednesday night. And, uh, you know, we already knew that this was a thing. Like social distancing was already a phrase that, that was out there. Like as, as we were all standing in line, um, normally we might have, uh, we, we, the fans might have shake, shaken hands or, or given hugs or whatever. And, and that wasn't going on. Uh, I saw some friends that like had a water bottle and they, they weren't, they, they, they were joking about like, Oh, well I would share it with you, but you know, and then it was while we were sitting at the event crammed in like sardines that the news broke about Tom Hanks having it, which was like, Again, he's a celebrity. He's just one person, but he's a celebrity that we all know. And it's like that one person that everybody in the world knows like, oh, that makes it a little, a little bit more real for those of us who haven't been affected in like in, in Wuhan or um, and then and then the news about the NBA canceling their season um, took place. And, and so I remember it, it was it was right as that news was breaking on all of our cell phones and people were looking at their cell phones that Charlotte was out there cutting a promo on Rhea Ripley. And she was saying, when I kick your ass in front of the millions of fans at WrestleMania, and we were we all just like turned to each other like, yeah, probably not that ain't happen. happening. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I call that a potential seeding event. I, I don't know if anybody actually did get infected while they were there, but it was definitely one of those things where it was like, yeah, even right now, we shouldn't be doing this um and, and so that was a little bit of the tone of it but it is it is interesting to think that you know they set that all up for that wednesday night show and i got to go in you know wrestling fans um i don't know yeah, dream fancy right. whatever it's it's because it's certainly that, intriguing to that wednesday, be like oh I'm, that i'm sorry, sorry but that, that that wednesday night that wednesday night nxt was actually taking place in the performance center anyway. They did have everything all set up. I was wrong. They did have everything set up because they couldn't they couldn't film at full sale that night. That's why the performance center was set up. I completely forgot about that. That's right. I'm glad you made that point because I was taking that as red and and it, yes, yeah. I, I was breezing right past that. Um so yeah, they they left it set up that way for a while and then I believe it was right after WrestleMania um, when by necessity, after having converted over to the WrestleMania set, they had to change the set again. Uh, I believe it was at that point that they uh, removed the chairs um, and they they got they thought outside the box a little bit more. 
um, or, as, or as I like to cutely phrase it, they thought inside of their own box that they're now stuck in um, to, to see if they could do something a little bit different with it. And, and I do feel, um, I'm not sure, I think, I think any listener can decide for themselves how much this really pertains to what I'm about to say about what draws me to wrestling, um, uh, just personally. Um, I haven't been bothered by the, the era without fans and without crowd noise because there are other things that I latch on to and I have found the best parts of this pandemic era of wrestling to be when WWE is getting creative with the sort of things that they can do, whether it be cinematic matches for better and as, as time has gone on more often than not for worse, um, but, or, or segments like, and I know that this might be a deep cut for a lot of people at the, even, even though it only aired just a couple months ago, but like, the newly bros show if anybody listening knows what that is i won't i won't you know belabor uh going into it but it was definitely an unconventional segment uh using certain uh they used the sound system for certain sound effects and it was definitely goofier than a lot of things that you would see but it still played into the storyline at hand that they were telling um it's the sort of thing that you would not have been able to do in in an arena with fans the way that they did it. So I like seeing them take advantage of the opportunity to get creative. Um, but where I come into wrestling, I, I actually don't have any kind of special story about like, oh, my grandfather watched it and he put me on his knee or I, I just grew up with it or, or my friend took me to an event. It was just as mundane as flipping channels. And even though that's not particularly special, I always I bring it up a lot because I think it's significant that I I had the luck I had the great fortune of flipping channels right at the height of a Stone Cold versus Vince McMahon uh, segment so so I came right in at a, at the crescendo of that right before the show went off the air a big reveal had just happened and I was immediately hooked by the story and that is where I feel wrestling strength is for me that's what drew me in. Um, I, I've had, I, there was one year where I took, uh, baseball very seriously and I got into a team. There was one year where I took football very seriously and I got into multiple teams and did fantasy and, and all this stuff, but that it never really sticks with me. And I feel like that's due to obviously real great, uh, sports stories exist, but when you have something like wrestling where they are manufacturing stories on a regular basis, multiple times per show. And it's like a soap opera. It's almost, I almost don't even want to use the word like, it's not just like a soap opera. It is a soap opera. I can get the thrill of watching a sporting contest with that story worked in. Um, and you know, I, I'm, I'm, as, as you know, Nate, uh, it was actually a little appropriate that we, opened with movies, uh, for me anyway, because I am, movies are really my thing. Like I talk about wrestling all the time. I probably at this point, the scales have tipped where I watch more wrestling than I do movies, but movies are really my primary hobby. And, and I think maybe one of my faults is that I always end up taking my hobbies super, super seriously, uh, to the point where sometimes it almost feels like work, but I, uh, you know, I view the art of movies so differently. Um, and I don't, where's the connection I wanted to make here? It's uh, sometimes w with, a, with a movie, the story doesn't matter. It's all about the style. It's all about the quality of the cinematography. Um, that's, sometimes it doesn't matter whether the story is simple or barely existent. Uh, it's, it's an art form that can exist, uh, that can uh, succeed on other strengths so than just the narrative. And with, um, with wrestling, I feel like it falls in between my passing interest in sport and my passion for cinema and, and blends the two together. And that's really where it hooks me in. Um, and, and then, of course, yeah, you talk about the showmanship and, and things like that. And, uh, and wrestling can gosh, there's just, there's a broad spectrum and it, it seems to be growing so, or it seems to be, it, it's absolutely growing so much more now where uh, wrestling reached su such a platform uh, a couple, a few decades ago that so many other smaller promotions sprouted up and became much more of a, 
it opened up a bunch of other territories to get creative with the way that they wanted to present wrestling. And that's where you get stuff like the Chikara promotion that Conrad brought up, which is sillier and does things that aren't as believable, but there is an audience for that. And if you are a casual fan, sometimes just going to one event and not taking it super seriously, it's a lot of fun to just throw yourself into enjoying that one event. And even though I am a wrestling fan who appreciates more of a realistic presentation and something that's more grounded and something that's less based on how many flips a guy can do, uh, I can also go to a one-off event where someone like Gentleman Jervis is booked and I will absolutely love it when he picks up his opponent and rocks them to sleep and tries to pin them but then the opponent wakes up and kicks out at two because the referee sneezed and the entire audience is playing along and shushing each other to try to not wake up the opponent. That's absolutely ridiculous. And if I saw something like that in WWE, I'd have a fit. But wrestling has so many different uh, venues that it can be presented in now that I think that sort of thing can be valid as well. So there are lots of different uh, uh, types of fans that I think wrestling can appeal to. Oh, no, 100%. And I mean, like, that was, that was really my thing with, with Chikara is just, just the zaniness of the wackiness of it. I mean, the fact that it, it's wrestling that you can, you, can comfortably, you can comfortably bring your kids to, you know, or, or you know, families to or, or anything like that. It wasn't, uh, you know, a lot of people think of wrestling that, you know, have no idea. And, and they, they do. They think a lot of the Attitude Era, the 90s, you know, Stone Cold, Flipping the Bird and Beers and, you know, scantily clad women and all this stuff. Um, but uh, you know, Shakara was definitely was definitely trying to to change that. Um, but Shakara Shakara was actually one of the promotions. There was actually a promotion that kind of got me back into wrestling. Um, believe it or not, um, at the time I was going to a believe believe it or not, I was going to a, a personal trainer, and um, my trainer says to me, "He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm training a wrestler, and uh, you know, I know you, I know you're kind of into wrestling. You used to be, you know." Uh, you know, I, I should, you guys should meet. And it just so happened that a couple of weeks later we had a, we, we happened to schedule him at the same time. And it happened to be a kid that I went to school with. Um, you know, he was a year ahead of me. Uh, I kind of, kind of knew him sort of, but I knew he was a wrestling fan. Um, and, uh, he, he actually wrestled for Shikara. Uh, he was Max Smashmaster. He became one of the two or one of the, uh, one of the tag team champions for Shikara for a little while. Um, wow. and, uh, you know, it, it was, so it was actually really cool. You know, so he starts, you know, we're, we're working out and he's kind of telling me about, you know, Shakara and the wackiness, craziness. And I went home, I went on a YouTube rabbit hole of Shakara. Um, and, and this was, this was right before the WWE network launched. I remember that because I remember finding out about the WWE network. Um, and now here I am, I, I fell right back into wrestling after not watching for a long time. Um, and uh yeah so it's actually kind of funny that we started talking about shikara because i was going to bring it up anyway um no everybody touched on points that that i kind of already wanted that i i, I already thought of and i wanted to make and uh like i said that was that was really kind of what i was hoping because um there there are so many different things that i think you can latch on to with professional wrestling um you know with with me the very first, the thing that, you know, is very similar to Tom, the thing that kind of hooked me into wrestling, um, flipping through the channels, and I, I happened to see, believe it or not, Mr. Ass, Billy Gunn. Um, wow. And he was, I remember just seeing him in the ring doing something, and I don't remember, I don't remember what, um, but I remember him, you know, having a match with somebody in the ring, and it, and it hooked me, and I, I knew kids at school were into wrestling, um, and I just kind of started watching, and and I was still a casual fan for a while until a, a, a buddy of mine, a kid that, that Conrad and I went to school with way back, um, this kid Tyler, um, wanted to go to a wrestling show. Um, we talked my dad into taking us, and it turned out to be the, the Monday Night Raw that Mick Foley put a whole bunch of butts in seats and won the world title uh, from... Oh, man. Um, from the rock, uh, you know, with the help of DX and stone cold and, and that giant, giant pop, that, that huge reaction from the crowd. Um, I, I still watch that pop when I need to be put in a good mood, right? Like that <laughs> thing is something else. It was unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. And I, to this day, I've haven't, 
there was one pop that actually I did experience, actually two of them that, that rival it. Um, one, uh, the, one of them was actually um, uh, an episode of SmackDown, July 4th edition of SmackDown. I forget the year, but um, Edge and Hulk Hogan won the tag team titles together in like 2003 or four or something. Um, the place went nuts in Boston, went crazy. Uh, and then uh, I think it was 2014, I went to a house show and uh, just a WWE house show and Bo Dallas is in the ring, just cutting, uh, cutting Boston down. And who would you think comes out but The Rock at a house show? And um, place went absolutely insane. He cut a crazy promo on Bo Dallas and you know, rock bottom, people's elbow, sent everybody home happy. And my, my wife, our roommate at the time, Josh, and I were like just stunned that like The Rock had just shown up at, at a non-televised event. It was crazy. Um, but I go back to that first first one I was talking about with Mick Foley back in, uh, I think it was 97. That is really what hooked me in, the, just the electricity of the crowd. And, um, and I was, at the time, I was also really, uh, really latched on to Mick Foley um, because I was, you know, I was always the fat kid. I was always the kid that didn't quite, I was the one that didn't look like Conrad, the athlete, you know? Um, and uh, that was okay, but you know, Mick Foley, he looked like me. Um, and like, I, I really, I really gravitated towards him and what he did. And, and the fact that he was able to kind of overcome the odds and win the title. Yeah, fine. He had some help, but he did it. Um, that's what hooked me in. And then Conrad also brought up Kane um, and really latching onto Kane and believe it or not, same here. Um, but not for the same reasons that Conrad did some similar, but um, you know, like, because I was like, I guess because I was the fat kid, I always kind of felt like I was singled out or, or you know, different or, or whatever. And that was Kane. Kane was different. He was supposedly burned in a fire and, and just badly scarred and, and an outcast in society. But he was this like monster that, you know, nobody wanted to mess with and, uh, you know, had just kind of like this built to this internal strength from all of the just all of the stuff that he had been through in, in his life. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it, like that was, that was really what one of the things that, that kind of drew me in as well is just kind of latching on to these characters and, and finding myself in a lot of these characters. Um, obviously the, the stories drew me in as well. I was a, I was a really naive kid. Um, I know Conrad knows, I know Tony knows, uh, I've touched on it on PWT Talks NXT a few times. And, uh, um, you know, so I was a very naive kid. So it's like, I believed, uh, I believed everything I was watching. Like, well, when, when The Undertaker was about to crucify Stephanie McMahon, like, I'm like, oh my God, this satanic guy, what the heck? Um, and like, I bought it hook, line and sinker for a while. And, uh, you know, but it drew me in and it, it, it gave me something to look forward to each week. And, um, uh, yeah, it was just, it was just this, the, the over the top characters and stories and, and everything. And even, even once I found out that Santa Claus wasn't real and, and wrestling wasn't either. Um, I still loved wrestling. I fell off of it for a few years. I think as a, as a lot of us do. Um, but I, I, I came back. Um, and it's, it's to this day, like I said, it's, it's what I do to escape. It's what I do to escape. Uh, two things real quick. Could you just quickly define pop for the non-wrestling fans? <laughs> yes. Yes, I can. Um, pop is just essentially another word for really loud reaction. Uh, it could be a boo. It could be a cheer. Uh, but just a really loud, guttural, visceral reaction from the crowd. T- typically, when you say pop, it's in, in the context of a, of a, of a, a cheering, you know, cheer reaction. Uh, but it could really mean either or. Okay, because like I, I thought I meant I thought I meant something like that, but like with the connotation with it was like I remember like the pop and like when you were talking about it, I was like, this sounds like some sort of like inner wrestling experience that I'm just yeah. like not aware of. <laughs> like uh, somebody got severely injured during that match, one of the two. <laughs> oh yeah, that too. Uh, um, I, I don't remember which one of I know it was one of the two of you guys went with me to a show in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Probably me. I went to a few of those shows you went, with you. And I, well, Conrad did too. I think it might have been you, Tony. Um, and we watched a match between the Golden Greek uh, Alex Arion 
versus um, the actually the person that ended up training uh, Sasha Banks, Brian Fury, uh, in a in a ladder match for the the WFA Championship, and huh. I I will never forget Alex Arion. Like Brian Fury was going to climb up the ladder for the belt. Alex Arion knocks him off, and he like uh, Fury goes tumbling over the top rope. Now we were sitting in the front row. He literally lands right in front of me, and I watched him blade. He stands up, and he bladed a little bit too much, and his eyebrow was draped over his eyeball. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, it was nuts. I don't know if, if you said I yikes. Conrad, it was, you, I th- yeah, I think, that, I think that was one of the ones that I, uh, I went to. That sounds very familiar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. I knew, I knew it was one of you guys. Um, but, you know, and, like, you know, that was, again, just – going to those shows and seeing everything live, especially where it wasn't WWE. We were very, so close to the action and, and all that stuff. Um, you know, it was, it was really cool. We were really cool. Um, you know, and that, I mean, that one really, of our buddies was, was wrestling at that point too, right? So actually, Dastardly yeah. Durant. So yeah. Um, Dastardly Durant. Uh, <laughs> well, so actually, and, and at the time, Max Smashmaster was on that show as well. Um, he was, it was actually their debut uh, debut match they debuted together um in the wfa uh it was their first match tag team match um and they went up against mike bennett and oh god somebody else but they were called the metro sexuals or metro men or something at the time i forget the gimmick but it was it was mike bennett um it was just which was cool i didn't actually even realize that until about a maybe about a month ago i happened to go back and look at Look at um, Max Smashmasters Pro uh, uh, Cage Fight dot net or whatever. Look at his his history, and I saw him like Metro Men. I saw Mike Bennett. And I'm like, oh my god, I, I didn't even realize that. Um, but uh, but yeah, yeah, that was that was their debut match. That was a debut match. So, but um, but no, guys, I, uh, I I certainly appreciate you guys taking your time out tonight to kind of you know, come in talk about talk about this with us. Uh, give your take on uh, you know on mental health and professional wrestling. Um, I know uh, I know we're on a little bit of a time crunch, but before we wrap up, I know you guys did maybe uh, get a little bit of an opportunity to check out our Worldwide Wrestling RPG gameplay, um, and we thought it might be fun just to kind of get the take of actual wrestling analysts for the wrestlers that we came or well, Conrad, Tony and Ben came up with. Um, so I don't know if you guys, uh, if you guys had any particular thoughts on either of the, any of these characters at all that you may want to share. Um, but, uh, Tom, do, do you at all? <laughs> sure. Um, I'll probably get the names wrong. Is it, is it, um, Conrad Steele? Cameron Steele. Cameron Steele. Cameron Steele. Uh, Cameron Steele uh, strikes me as a more gr- grounded. I don't want to say believable and make the other guys think that their characters aren't believable, but <laughs> I guess believable in the context of wrestling that we are familiar with. He sounds the most like a real, the real story of somebody that that we might, uh, the somebody who might make it big in the top promotion. And you look back and, and you see like, oh, yeah, he used to be named Cameron Steele. You know, he, he used to have some serious drug problems. And uh, he, he actually, dark secret, he got into wrestling because he just wants to hurt people. And, um, and of course, the, the fact that he's from, what was it, the Hamptons or something like that reminds Hamptons, me of yeah. Triple H. Um, yep. and, okay, uh, that's what and, I thought, too. That's crazy that you said that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's and, and wild. Hampton, Hampton, New Hampshire is a, is a upscale, ritzy... Um, beach town here in new hampshire yep yep and uh and puny i think um i i've only had the pleasure of uh playing one role-playing game with you guys but i could already tell that this is definitely a conrad creation (laughs) and it seems to me like maybe in today's wrestling context this guy's ceiling is a a mid carter on aew which um i guess for the people that like that show, that's a good thing. Um, that's actually but, a higher ceiling than I thought. Yeah. Um, I, I think I'm okay with it. I, it, it maybe, maybe reminds me of something like a Santino or maybe a Eugene where there, Eugene, there is some yeah. depth to be mined from the character past the surface, but, um, but, but definitely good for some comedy segments and, uh, and the mind creep. Um, 
to bring up Gentleman Jervis again, one of his character building seminars uh, that he does on, on Instagram Live, or at least used to do, he taught me that uh, when it comes to the heel face, it, it, whether you're a heel or a face or a tweener, it's not just one or the other. There is a spectrum. And the same goes for whether you're like a really bright, happy, cheery guy like John Cena or whether you're like a really dark, sinister guy like The Undertaker. And the mind creep is starting off at the bottom of that spectrum. So he's only giving himself one direction to go. Uh, and, and that's up. So if you wanted to go lower, he's already starting off really low, which might be a disadvantage. But I like the the advantage that he's already giving himself that even though he's not a good wrestler, he's really fully gimmicked up. So he can rely on other things to get himself over. Um, and And all of what I've said, I have no idea how it pertains to the actual way that this game is played. And if anything regarding like the spectrum or being gimmicked and not being a good wrestler or excelling in comedy segments would actually be an advantage or disadvantage to the player. But those are the, those are my takeaways. You actually hit those the are all mechanics in the game. Yep. yep. <laughs> yeah. Like you, uh, you called it, man. You called it as you normally do, as you normally do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get, I get a few every once in a while. The, That's the, true. The recent Phantasma thing, like, I don't want to pat myself on the back, but this, at the same time, I'm like, dude, I called every single to- part of this. You really <laughs> did. Every move, every yeah. move. And Zach, what about you, man? What, uh, what did you think of uh, these guys' characters? Yeah, so I'll, so time stole my thunder with the Triple, triple H comparison, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, but the, what, what I'll spend time on is, is the, the puny character as well. When I, when I look at the framework of that and, and I compare it to wrestling, what sticks out in my head is just is uh, you don't really know the ceiling because I'm just not sure how you know well it goes back to just sympathy like I see that character as like the sympathy drawing baby face and it could be something that ends up at, at, at like Santino level or you know it could be something that gets just gets you know, a ton of momentum and is like, you know, the Daniel Bryan push where you're beat down, beat down, beat down. And then you're, but eventually, you know, you finally get your, your comeuppance. And, and I think, I, I don't know, in wrestling, I think all baby faces need to have that in some form or fashion, even like the, the, the badass ones, like, like Steve Austin, like you, you, you know, you, you watch enough of his work and you're like, that's still there. Like you still feel for him. Um, even though he's a badass, you still feel for him. But on the other side of the coin, it's like, because that that that's how you engage with the crowd in, in in some ways, and I think the that element of sympathy is is there with that with that character like just brightly, um, and is like one of the first things I, I thought of outside of the Triple H comparison. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. That's awesome. I definitely uh, definitely appreciate it. It uh, it's uh, it, it again kind of hit the I think kind of hits the nail on the head with Point Extra Puny, and uh, at least where where I was originally going to go with the story. Um, I don't want to give spoilers away at this point, but uh, you know, as, ha- as it happens in these RPGs, the players like to like to throw some curveballs at the, at the GM and they certainly did with me. Um, so, you know, but, but it definitely is, is kind of in line with what we were originally thinking for the character. But um, Zach, Tom, I know, uh, you know, again, like I said, certainly appreciate you guys, uh, you know, taking the time out tonight. Zach, I know you're on a bit of a time crunch. Would you like to, uh, you know, quickly, uh, quickly say, uh, you know, say goodbye and, and, you know, feel free to plug really anything that you would like to. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure being on with you guys. It's, it's such a, uh, it's, I really love being able to, to talk wrestling with anybody, but also to talk it with, uh, uh, uh knowledgeable folks and, and from a different perspective and a different scope uh, uh than a usual conversation so it's been a blast um and yeah just uh, you can follow me on twitter at z Haydorn torch at z h e y d o r n torch you can find most of my work um there but mainly at pwtorch.com um right there just on the on the main page is uh where some of my written stuff 
is. Uh, the links to uh, my VIP podcast is there on the canvas. That's uh, uh, I talked a lot about the, the artistry of wrestling on this show, and my show for the torch is just really ingrained in that topic and kind of leaving, you know, who should win and who should lose at the door, and just really honing in on the artistry. Um, of wrestling. That's uh, the weekly show that drops for uh, PW Torch VIP members. So head to pwtorch.com and, uh, and go VIP to, uh, to check it out. That's right. And if you do go VIP, you can actually check out Tom's new podcast. Tom. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, on, on that VIP side of things. Uh, well, well, for starters, of course I do the show with you. Uh, covering current NXT, it's it's the uh, torch. I, honestly, I, I've started taking to calling it the torch's official NXT post show because you know what? That's what it is, and it's a live yeah. call-in show, so you can participate live with us. Hey, Wade, uh, and, Wade called it that when I was on with him, so we'll we'll call it that. Why not? Perfect. So it's even officially official now. Um, yeah, but that that is on the daily cast feed. Um, the, the editor in chief, the, the founder of PW Torch, uh, Wade Keller has things, uh, uh, broken up in, in different ways. And, and, and this one is called the daily cast feed. Uh, so that is where you can find that weekly, uh, podcast, but yes, indeed on that VIP side of things, uh, recently along with, um, our, our friend from PWT talks NXT, Kelly Wells, I am doing an eight year look back. Uh, eight years may be an odd number, but we're in the middle of a pandemic and people were looking for more content. And so we started and we were coming up on the first episode of NXT that emanated from here. At, well, I live here in Orlando, here uh, in, in the Full Sail Live studio, uh, which really ushered in a new era of NXT and, and is much more similar to the way we know it today as opposed to the way it really started in 2010. Um, so every Saturday we go eight years back to the exact date that the episode aired and break it down. And we're looking at people who either fizzled out or became stars or other. Uh, and it's, it's been very, very interesting thus far. And, uh, and other than that, you can follow me on Twitter at Tom Stoup, T O M S T O U P. And I promote anything there that I feel is worth promoting. I'm not sure if I'm going to be finished with my short film uh, that I'm in post-production on by the time this drops, but uh, I filmed, when, when I didn't have quite as bad of a back, I filmed a, a something in uh, 2015 where uh, not only was I like, it, you know, shoestring budget filmmaking, so I basically was doing everything uh, along with a buddy of mine, uh, along with acting in it and there are fight scenes and we definitely take bumps and go through objects like wrestlers do um and uh and the footage just sat on my hard drive for a long long time but now i'm finally putting it together and um and if anyone listened to this because they like wrestling and they think uh, that, that that jackass who was talking i want to see him go through a table well uh at tom Stop on twitter is where i'll be able to show you that and uh, I do have to say, I finally did watch the trailer. I've been meaning to tell you, and uh, I really liked it. It was actually really I think, good. So I think the table spots in the trailer, isn't it? It might have been. It might have been. I think it was. <laughs> it was. So uh, yeah, guys, at Tom Stubb, check it out. Check it out. All right, and this has been another episode of the Deejcast for Conrad and for Tony. I am Nate Lindbergh, and we will see you next time. Take care. <laughs>